between the time when antediluvian races ruled the earth and the oceans drank Atlantis. There came the lands of Hyperborea, a land undreamed of, with strange skies and creatures of foul aspect. Unto these lands came heroes with great power over sorcery and steel, destined to carve their paths onto these troubled lands of ice and fire. It is I, the chronicler who alone can tell thee of their deeds. Let me tell you of Hyperborea, a land of high adventure. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, I'm Captain Courageous and I review old school modules and games and try to give them a fun and informative analysis. If you couldn't tell by the intro, I'm pretty pumped about this review of Astonishing Swordsmen and Sorcerers of Hyperborea. Longtime viewers of the channel know that I'm a big fan of pulp fantasy and the works of H.P. Lovecraft, Robert E. Howard, Robert Block. Clark Ashton Smith, Fritz Leiber, Edgar Rice Burroughs, Michael Moorcock, L. Sprague de Camp, and old pulp fiction publications from the 20s and 30s such as Weird Tales, Amazing Stories, and so on. If you too are a fan of gritty pulp fantasy heroes such as Conan the Barbarian, Call the Conqueror, Favard and the Grey Mauser, Tarzan the Ape Man, John Carter of Mars, Elric of Melibone, and the Hyborian Cycle by Clark Ashton Smith, and you are a fan of gritty old school role playing games, then have I got a game for you. Astonishing Swordsmen and Sorcerers of Hyperborea takes its cue from all of those works of fiction, as well as the tried and true RPG game framework of Arneson and Gygax, and distills all of this into an amazingly functional, and dare I say, astonishingly innovative role-playing game. Written originally and created by Jeffrey Talanian, the game's multi-volume first edition box set was released back in 2012. There was a Kickstarter in 2017 for an updated second edition, and the result was a massive all-in-one 622-page rulebook that contains not just the rules, but a fully developed gazetteer of the Hyperborea campaign setting. So let's open the hardbound cover off this massive behemoth of a game and see what makes it tick. Under the hood is essentially the framework of first edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. There are character classes, but the only playable race is human. No elves, halflings, or dwarves to be found. However, humans vary in appearance and temperament depending on what region of Hyperborea they come from, and there are 12 racial types presented. There are the scattered remnants of the once great Atlanteans, Celts, Vikings, Hyperboreans, and so on. Though it is important to note there is no specific in-game benefits for selecting a race. This is all flavor, though certainly the referee is able to modify things if such is desired. There are the four core character classes, of course, Fighter, Magician, Cleric, and Thief, but there are 22 fully developed subclasses. There are Warlocks, a fighter subclass that wields both steel and sorcery interchangeably. There are specialty spellcasters like the Cryomancer, a sorcerer who commands the elemental power of ice. The Necromancer, a sorcerer who practices black magic and communicates with the dead. The Pyromancer and Witch. Witches specialize in the brewing of potions, divinations, and curses. The various cleric subclasses are Rune Graver, a mystic warrior who carves spells on bone, metal, stone, and wood, and a primal sorcerer who confers with ancestral totem spirits called the Shaman. Among thieves there are bards, Legendomonists, Purloiners, and Scout. 
and more. Each of these subclasses, along with the core classes, all tweaked to capture the raw pulp feel of the setting. Level advancement tops out at level 12, which I particularly feel is a great stopping point anyway. Similarly, alignment is tweaked to only five types, representing civilization or law, to barbarism or chaos, as well as true neutrality. The game adheres to the old school way of thinking in that great deviation from one's ethos confers various in-game penalties, including loss of experience or even a level. However, like many aspects of the game, the exact details are left to be specified by the game's referee, which comes to a very important point about the game. Much of it is open-ended and uncodified in the best tradition of the OSR. For example, when reading scrolls of higher level or beyond one's normal understanding, it is possible to not only fail, but to trigger backfire. What exactly that backfire is, and how severe it is, and what the exact results are, are left entirely up to the referee. Character heritage and background is a big part of the game. This will dictate the character's outlook and ethos, as very likely what sorts of deities the character venerates. The pantheon of Hyperborea is an amalgam of the Greek gods and the pulp works of Clark Ashton Smith and H.P. Lovecraft. The rules on magic remain rooted very much on the Vancean style of memorization and study, and that includes clerical magic as well as sorcery. Spell books and prayer books are used. Clerics deal in occult scriptures and secret mysteries, while the various magicians wield the chaotic forces of sorcery and compile massive volumes of spells. Acquisition of new spells is primarily gained through exploration and research. The specifics are which are once again left in the hands of the referee to, to determine based on their own campaign. Sorcerers memorize and study while clerics must pray, perform rituals, speak in tongues, or what have you. The specifics are left to the player and referee's desires based on the flavor of the campaign being run and the character type. On the martial side of things, the game is wonderfully tactical but not overly so, and much of it is left to option rules that allow the participants to sculpt the crunchiness of the game to suit their tastes. Like first edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, weapon skill is determined by class, with magicians being the weakest in the area and warriors being dominant. Unskilled attack penalties are based on character class and a chart provided to make adjudication of such very easy. Furthermore, fighters and their subclasses are eligible for weapon mastery. This allows for attack and damage bonuses with specific weapons as well as increased attack routines per round of combat. Multiple attacks per round combined with weapon mastery can lead to some very powerful attack routines at higher levels, and I'll get to that in just a moment. There's a healthy list of weapons to choose from, and statistics include weapon class. This is a much simplified system over original AD&D that is similar to weapon speed. If you are familiar with those rules from the original game, weapon class is used to help determine first strike by weapon size, with lower weapon classes equating to smaller size and higher weapon classes equating to larger size weapons. A weapon two size larger will allow for a first strike when encountered regardless of initiative. I was never really a big fan of how weapon speed was implemented in 1E and d and really like this simplification. Furthermore, each weapon gets its own notation and rules such as whether it can or must be wielded one or two handedly setting to receive a charge, use of a weapon while mounted, and so on. The paragraph descriptions further define the weapon characteristics and in-game applications, such as the garrote, which can be used to strangle an opponent to death regardless of hit points, or a quarterstaff, which provides its wielder with superior pairing ability. With martial characters, weapon selection is a major aspect of the character, and I really like the additional details provided for here, enough to make weapons in the game interesting and unique without bogging the game down with too many rules. The combat rules for this game are both familiar to those who've played older editions of Dungeons & Dragons, but deviate in interesting ways to not only clarify the rules, but also to maintain the pulp fantasy flavor of the game that it is trying to project, and I'll try to summarize the major differences here. Saving throws are really interestingly done, and I very much approve. As per old school Dungeons & Dragons, there are five 
but they are renamed Death, Transformation, Device, Avoidance, and Sorcery. Furthermore, there is but one actual save number, and it is defined by the character's level, as shown by this chart here. However, each class can then modify the five subcategories or saves. For example, a thief gains a plus two on their save on device and avoidance rolls. Furthermore, saves are additionally modified by attribute scores, such as dexterity, constitution, and wisdom. Thus, to make a save, roll a d20, add the appropriate modifier, and compare it to the character's base save number. Of course, magical items can modify a save, and as usual, the referee is free to add whatever bonuses or penalties are deemed appropriate for the situation at hand. Initiative and action resolution are probably the most complex modifications of the rules here, but I find this to be a great simplification in the long run. Order is determined by a simple throw of a d6 per side, but each round is further subdivided into two phases. The participants on each side will first go through phase one in initiative order, and then phase two. So, for example, a magician who simply wishes to cast a spell can do so on phase one. However, if movement is also desired, the spell will go off on phase two. For those who have multiple attack routines per round, the sequence is cleverly explained with three charts. One for melee, one for missile fire, and one for spells, making the chaos of combat easier to resolve for the referee. While this may appear to be overly complex upon first examination, familiarizing yourself on how multi-actions are resolved in each instance will quickly reveal how each follows a logical sequence. Once players become familiar with these routines, certainly combat will go along quite quickly. This two-phase sequence is great for allowing for hold actions and strategic planning, as the winning of initiative does not mean the winning side must act first. How this is resolved is dependent on how many attacks per round the character gets, and this is great for helping resolve monsters with multiple attack routines as well. I really like this solution to action economy in the game, and it certainly has many advantages over the overly complex routines in later editions of Dungeons & Dragons. There is an advanced combat section where various actions such as arrow setting, disarm, dodging, the double arrow shot, off-weapon parries, reckless fighting, and so forth can be employed to add variety and excitement to combat, allow for some fun tactical options, and keep things from becoming stale. Detailed rules for two-handed fighting and critical hits are provided. One of the things I really like about this rule set is how many examples are given and when a rule is referenced, the page number of that rule is immediately provided. I've spent quite a bit of time buried in the rules of the game over the last week or so, and in just about every case where I needed to reference back to a referred to rule, the page number was handily provided for me. The Bestiary, for Astonishing Swordsmen and Sorcerers of Hyperborea, contains much of the typical fare one would find in a Dungeons & Dragons game, except for the dragons, but definitely favors those monsters that align with the theme of the rule set. Included are abominations such as abeloths and ropers, giant insects, fungi and jellies, and foul humanoid races. Orcs are of the porcine type depicted in the original game. There are crab men, snake men, cave men, and so on. Further, the monster list entails a menagerie of Lovecraftian creatures such as the Color Out of Space, the Migo, Fishmen who worship Dagon, the Great Race of Yith, and so on. Then there are the Lovecraftian inspired creatures such as the Tentacular Horror, a creature clearly mimicking John Carpenter's The Thing. The list of demons is comparative with seven classes of greater demons, 15 classes of lesser demons, as well as those demons that are so bizarre as to defy categorization. Even familiar creatures get a pulp Lovecraftian spin here, so those familiar with the game already will have to do their due diligence and delve into the bestiary to fully absorb its secrets. The list of beasties here is certainly not exhaustive, but it is quite comprehensive. As with everything else in this rule set, the list of magical treasures is both familiar and comprehensive. While many of the familiar items are here, what you won't find are elven cloaks or dwarven axes. Instead, these have been supplanted with 
setting-based items such as the ring of the Hyperborean King that summons an elemental, but only a true-born Hyperborean can control it, or Selene's Crescent, a plus-two scimitar that shines with the pale radiance of the Hyperborean moon Selene. Further, if a sacrifice of an Arak is made to Lunaqua under the fullness of Selene, the wielder also gets plus two to saving throws for the next 23 days. Thus, the referee will have a lot of fun delving into the usually familiar list of magic items to discover those that are fresh and new. To me, the crown jewel of the book is the setting Hyperborea. The geography is bizarre and weird to say the least. A single huge landmass surrounded by many smaller islands, the world itself being a concave hexagonal plain resting on an inky black firmament called the North Wind. The look of the sky is strange as the world's massive sun lingers along the horizon, never actually reaching a zenith overhead. And while it is huge and seemingly close, it gives off a weak reddish light that doesn't really provide much warmth. High above, the planet Saturn can be seen quite plainly, as well as the odd-shaped moons Phobos and Selene, whose orbits dictate the length of months and passage of time, similar to the old Earth calendar with 13 months of 28 days each. A true sidereal year is actually 13 old Earth years long. The seasons and night fall tend to last for years, and a complex cyclical calendar is provided to keep track of the seasons. This adds greatly to the flavor of the setting with winter and nightfall and summer and daylight lasting for years. When a campaign begins, will have a great deal of effect on gameplay going forward, depending on where in the 13-year cycle the referee chooses to begin the campaign. Thus, the tracking of the planets Ganymede, Saturn, Poseidonus, and Yagoth become very important to determine the passage of time and the placing of festivals and so on. The lands of the place are dotted with the ruins of the once great snake men civilization, and eldritch secrets and technologies from past ages are a major source of investigation and inquiry by sages and those who seek power. Hyperborea was once part of an antediluvian earth, and at some point in the past separated off to become an isolated realm of sorcery and lost technology. The peoples of Hyperborea reflect this strange heritage. There are Vikings and Celts, Chimerians and savage barbarians, as well as Amazons and Picts. Demon worship is prevalent, as are cults of Cthulhu. There is no major empire of this place, as Hyperborea is 500 years emergent from a dark age brought on by the plague of green death thousand years before that nearly brought the human race to extinction. Thus, population centers are sparse with major cities comprising 2,000 to 30,000 persons. There are a few prominent fortified city-states such as Cromarium and Port Zangarios, but it is the villages and towns that the player characters will encounter most often. I could do an entire video on this section alone as Talanian seemingly pulls out locations from the pages of Lovecraft and Ashton Smith. Dagan Bay hosts the town of Port Greeley, a place clearly inspired by Lovecraft's Innsmouth. There is the city-state of Kor, an ancient city located beyond the River Vol. Formerly a great Hyperborean city, it is now dominated by a race of highly intelligent ape men. It sports a population of 5,000 of these creatures, and they own human slaves. The most dominant city-state is Cromarium, once the jewel of Hyperborea and devastated by the Green Death. It is now a seedy, smoke-choked shadow of its former self, sporting a population of around 30,000. The entire gazetteer is nothing short of inspired and will make for hours of fun reading by the referee, and certainly the inspiration for years of weird tales and adventure stories. A massive map of Hyperborea is provided, and by massive, you will need a pretty large table simply to unfold and view the thing in all its glory. Certainly, it provides the final picture of the place described in the text, but functionally, at least for me, it has issues. Despite its size, the actual depicted areas are rather small. Other older grognards will definitely need their glasses here, and maybe even a magnifying glass, which is a real shame. There is a hint of a hex grid overlay obvious in the ocean areas of the map, but nearly indistinguishable in the overland areas. Far more useful is the ultra-high resolution JPEG map 
a drive through RPG. This 20 megabyte file will allow you to zoom in on areas in ways that aren't possible on the physical map. Furthermore, one must ask how to display this poster. Its odd size and bulk makes framing out of the question and it most definitely will require a lot of wall real estate. Though certainly the problem here lies specifically with the fictional geography of the place. The best alternative that I could imagine was to split the thing into four poster sections, which is certainly untenable as well due to the added expense. So let me recommend that you grab the quality JPEG file available at Drive-Thru RPG for only $3. There are six appendices to this massive rule set. Appendix A is referee advice. Appendix B covers the weather. Appendix C is a very nice rogues gallery, but it is D and E that are the most useful in my opinion. If there's anything that I am frequently critical of with OSR clones, it is a failure to include a starting adventure. Astonishing Swordsmen and Sorcerers of Hyperborea goes one better here with not only providing a great starting adventure at the Black Moss Hag of Lug, but also a detailed starting setting, Swampgate. There is a detailed history of the place, a provender, where the resources come from, how law is meted out, including detailing the town council with full NPC write-ups, notable NPCs of the place, the ever-wonderful rumors table, a look at the town's defenses, and a wonderfully rendered old-school map. To kick things off right, the included adventure, the Black Moss Hag of Lug, oozes pulp flavor, as the PCs try to resolve the mystery of two disappeared lovers. Plenty of opportunities for role-playing, as well as good old hack-and-slash dungeon crawling. I personally can't wait to run this one myself. Organizationally, this massive brick of a tome is very well done and follows a logical flow, making things generally easy to find. There is a master table of contents to direct the reader to each of the six main sections, and then each of the major sections has a very detailed table of contents as well. Stunningly, what this massive 622-page tome does not have is an index. I'm sorry, Luke, but it's true. I know, it's devastating that this almost near-perfect rule set fails at this most basic of tasks, especially when one considers just how massive the thing is. Game designers, I love you guys, I do. The amount of raw creativity, inspiration, and perseverance it takes to write something so comprehensive and then getting it published, amazing. Now, do your due diligence, pay the expense for an indexer, especially when you have a successful Kickstarter where all the goodies are unlocked, and put an index in the thing. Now fortunately, if you have the PDF, it is searchable, and I had that one on hand as I wrote the script for this review, and thank goodness I did, or this task would have been quite the chore. But an index provides not only the ability to find a specific role quickly, but also specific mentions of a topic throughout a volume of work, something that a table of contents is woefully unsuited for. It's like baking the perfect cake, but not adding the icing. <sighs> Talanian's prose for this rule set is clearly informed by his familiarity with pulp fiction. It is intelligently written and enjoyable to read. In fact, his style is very distinctive and comparable to Gygax in this respect, though I would not call it Gygaxian. Instead, I would call it Talanian. Consistently, wherever it's needed, examples are provided to demonstrate and clarify the game's concepts, and reference rules page numbers are immediately provided. This doesn't substitute for an index, but it does soften the blow a little. Artwork for this rule set is consistently on point, and there is plenty of it. I was really appreciative of all the art pieces, including the weird skyline and geography of the place, both in black and white and in color. Each new book section is separated by a full color plate that is both evocative of pulp comics of the era, and even some allusions to modern works like the Marvel, Conan the Barbarian, and even Heavy Metal magazine. This is gonzo pulp fantasy and Weird science role-playing at its finest, and the artwork complements this significantly. Currently, this rule set that sold for $65 is unfortunately out of print, but when I spoke with Jeffrey Tillanian, he assured me that Northwind Adventures was about to begin a brand new Kickstarter for this rule set, so you'll have to depend on either grabbing a PDF at drive through RPG for $19, or check out the auction sites for a second-hand purchase, though you can expect to pay a premium price, unfortunately. 
that may suggest that a comprehensive index be added among the stretch goals for the Kickstarter reprint. Still available, however, is the awesome 300-page player's manual, which is basically volumes 1, 2, and 3 from the primary rulebook, which is certainly worth having in its own right for convenience at the table when referencing player information. In addition, there are quite a few other adventures available, and while I've not read them in depth yet, they definitely seem to be pretty darn good. So let's go ahead and take a look at Astonishing Swordsmen and Sorcerers of Hyperborea on my D20 scale of style, presentation, and value. Style-wise, this rulebook hits all the marks. It looks great, and the artwork is evocative and inspirational, and there is a lot of it. Hardly a page goes by without some great pulp eye candy, and the team of artists Talanian hired are to be commended for their work here. The chapter color plates are great, and considering how weird the setting is, having this great artwork on the page really cements in the imagination how strange all of this is. I'm going to rate this a natural 20, a critical hit. As far as the presentation goes, again, this rule set hits all the marks. Some might say that due to my own personal preferences, I was predisposed to love this game, but there's a lot more to it than that. It's well organized. There are plenty of examples when needed, and rules referenced are immediately given page numbers. The prose is descriptive, and Talanian's pulp vocabulary is on full display here, and that gives this rule set its own unique style, while at the same time, it is still clear and easily understood. Never does it come off as pretentious, and makes reading the rules more enjoyable, not less. After 40 years in the hobby, it is rare that I just sit down and devour a rule book like I did with this one, and much of that goes to how the rules are so well written. Included is not only an excellently detailed setting, Swamp Gate, but also a great first adventure that clearly demonstrates the types of adventures that are meant to be played here. Every tweak of character class rules of the 1E e D&D game is in service of the pulp feel that the rules are attempting to emulate, and while some concepts are complex, never are they difficult to understand due to the healthy inclusion of examples. I would give this another natural 20, the very first double critical hit I've ever awarded here, were it not for the fact that an index is not provided which given the 622 page bulk of this rule set is to me an unforgivable oversight. So I'll rate it an 18. Lastly, for value, there is a bit to unpack here. I don't see $65 for this 622 page old school pulp art behemoth to be unreasonable in the least. In fact, I'd say it's a great deal, but certainly the price point will be a barrier for some. So I'll rate this a 19. So that brings the overall rating for Astonishing Swordsmen and Sorcerers of Hyperborea to a 19. Amazing. Or, as some might even say, astonishing. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you found this extra long video review informative and useful. Wednesday, I'm going to change things up a bit with a classic module review with Dave Cook's X5, The Temple of Death. And next Saturday, I will delve back into the Gazetteer series with the Principalities of Galantry. As usual, I'd like to give a big shout out and thank you to all my patrons. If you enjoyed this review, please subscribe and click the little bell so you'll get updates when I add new content. Please give this video a like, comment, and share. Join the channel's Facebook page, RPG Reviews, and consider supporting the channel by becoming a patron yourself. Or alternatively, you can just send a tip through the PayPal tip jar, link in the description. As always, my friends, may your D20 roll true and game on.